You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Chapter 17 Natasha The next day arrived a lot sooner than anticipated. Had they thought of everything? As Jane prepared their props, Mark was on the phone to the hospital to check they were expected and that they could talk to the gunshot patients. Their visit was confirmed by a senior registrar and was arranged for ten that morning. We've been up this street twice already, commented a nervously irritable Jane. I do know that. Have another look at the map, she suggested. They had planned on finding the location the day before, but the preparation had taken up all their time. Look for a signpost for Maryville Infirmary. A sign might not mention the word hospital. Okay, okay, I'm looking... All the streets looked the same, and the time was fast approaching ten. They eventually found the access road with the main hospital in full view ahead. The car park was landscaped with rows of beautiful lush green trees, set in strips of garden beds dividing the area into neat lots. After parking and gathering up all the gear they needed to take with them, they both walked across to the entrance. On turning the corner... The main reception hall for admissions faced them, strangely, though, with hardly a soul to be seen. At reception, Mark rang the desk bell, and a rather austere senior nurse popped her head around the corner of the door to the room behind the desk, quickly throwing down a magazine onto a chair Mark noticed, reflected in the glass-paneled half-open door. "'Good morning,' she said, hands palm down on the desk." "'Good morning. We're expected at around ten. I spoke to your senior registrar earlier on the phone, but I don't know the name of the doctor we are to see,' apologized Mark. "'That would be Dr. Freeman. He left a memo asking for you to go straight up to his room. You are doctors Granger and Ryder from England?' She checked, even though their English accents were entirely apparent. "'Just wait here a moment, I'll... Better just check he's in his room. She moved to the far end of the long reception desk and picked up the phone. Ah, Dr. Freeman, the two doctors from England have arrived. Shall I? Oh, right. Straight up now. Thank you. She turned to Mark and Jane. This way, if you please. They followed her up to the next floor, where she then directed them to Dr. Freeman's room. Mark thanked her, and as she went back down to the reception, they made their way along a ghastly gray corridor, two lefts and a right, and they should be there. Do I look the part as a doctor? remarked Jane. A door in front of them was open, which Mark put his head around whilst knocking. Now do come in, a voice said, giving them a warm and hearty American-style welcome. As they entered the room, they saw the man who would make or break their plan. He was a jolly, burly sort of man who, right from the start, showed great interest in their statistical work. Eddie Rayner tells me you want to check out our gunshot patients. Our latest victim is a strange young lady, obviously Russian. She spoke nothing else when she finally came out of the anesthetic. Do you know, I removed four bullets from her neck and chest, and none, I repeat none, had caused any significant damage. Astounding, isn't it? How someone can be so lucky. I wasn't so lucky. Still got bloody shrapnel moving around in my leg. Gives me hell at times. All Mark could think of was not only had this young lady been extremely lucky, but so had they. She was conscious and able to speak, albeit in Russian. Will she speak to us uh, about the incident? asked Jane cautiously. Well, yes, if you can understand Russian. He was certainly amused at the predicament. Not so, Mark and Jane. The first thing they must establish is that the girl in the bed is the same as the girl in the photographs which Jane had with her in her document case. This they would have to decide for themselves so as to not arouse any suspicion of their true reason for being there. 
How, for instance, could they possibly explain with any credibility their possession of photographs of her, especially ones obviously taken from a TV screen when the girl had never been shown on it? Mark was just on the verge of asking to be taken to her bed when Dr. Freeman spoke. I must say I'm really interested in your project on New York shootings. I've spent some time in the city a good many years now, he recollected nostalgically as he walked over to the window, hands in his pockets and leaning back slightly as if to tease the imaginary backache those times had given him. Terrible, some of those patients we were expected to put back together. No one's safe these days. It's a bustling city where no one, except close family, can trust each other. I remember one case. It was in... Mark apologetically butted in. I'm sorry to rush you, but we have rather a tight schedule at the moment. If we could uh, see this Russian patient first, please. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I do go on a bit. My wife's always on at me about it. Getting old, that's what it is. Going on about the past all the time. We do understand. You must have some great stories to tell, commented Jane tactfully. We sure do. Now, let me clear it with the security guards upstairs. He went over to the phone, picked it up, and put it down again, looking thoughtful. Mark took a quick glance at Jane. Something wasn't quite right. Why had he not contacted the guards? Dr. Freeman turned and faced them, his forehead furrowed with concern of some kind. They were sure they'd been rumbled. Freeman went to speak. It was in 1964. That's it. And that was the memory that'll live with me till I die. Machine-gunned, he was, a young guy about your age. Mark stopped him there with a wide smile of relief on his face, reflected in Jane's. The guards. You were going to clear us with the security guards? Mark reminded him. Ah, yes. There's no point in phoning, because they're not allowed to leave their positions, you see. It may be a trick to divert attention. Someone sure wants that poor gal dead. I'll take you up personally. They know me, he said with a husky laugh quickly turning into a full-blown coughing session. On the third-floor landing stood a tall, mean-looking armed guard. Okay to come through? Freeman checked. The guard turned to look at them one by one, then stepped to one side. Further along the corridor stood two more men, also with guns like the first. They stood either side of the private room door, where all the curtains were drawn shut, except for the door window. Dr. Freeman himself had to show an ID card. They'll sure want to see yours, too, he quipped. Mark fumbled for his card and Jane for hers, passing them over to be scrutinized. The guards returned the cards and took out a key to unlock the door. All three passed through and into the room, the guard locking the door behind them. There, asleep on the bed, could be the very person who could prevent a grave international incident or a full-scale nuclear war. Dr. Freeman went over to her and gently shook her awake. For a moment she was startled to see three people at her bedside, but not half as startled as Mark and Jane were. They had no need to consult Uncle David Pollock's handiwork, for this was the girl in Fraser's dreams. Of that there was no doubt. Fraser's memory image on the photographs was uncannily true to life, proof that the dream machine really did work. She immediately started to speak long phrases in Russian, completely alien to any of them. Mark suggested that if they sat with her for a while, they might glean something, especially with the help of a pencil and paper. This came as something of a blow. Weren't all Russian secret agents fully conversant with the English language? Dr. Freeman left the room to hunt out some paper. Of course, they had plenty with them on a statistical exercise such as this, but they wanted desperately to be alone with her for the questions they needed to ask, if only they could. The moment the guard locked the door after Freeman, Jane turned to try and communicate with her as best she could. 
she switched on the NoteMate mini-cassette recorder, hoping the room wasn't bugged. It was a risk that they had to take. Nathan Fraser, she began in earnest. Do you know of a Nathan Fraser? Jane added emphasis by gesticulation. To their utter amazement, she began speaking in almost perfect English. Nathan? Where is he? Is he alive and well? She asked them both with pleading desperation in her eyes. Tell me, please, where is he? She repeated. Jane's eyes dropped from hers. I'm sorry, but he's dead. She hated saying the words, just as she had done more tactfully on a few occasions before to the relatives of a deceased patient. The girl tried to hold back her emotion, her eyes dampening. Please, asked Jane, what is your name? If you can tell us, we are here to help you. We believe we know the whole story, that is, except... She looked to Mark for an agreement to go on. He nodded. Except the exact location of the bomb. Too many people know about it. She looked at them with disbelief and then with resignation. A few moments passed while she collected her emotions. My name is Natasha. Now, how have you obtained all this information? Can I trust you? I must trust someone, please. She quietly sobbed into her handkerchief. Look, Natasha, Mark chipped in with a quiet firmness to his voice. You can trust us. Whoever has let you down in the past, you can be sure to trust us, he assured her. We obtained the information about this whole affair by chance. It's a long story, which I'll tell you about when we've more time, but for the moment, we desperately need your help. At that point, they heard the key turned in the lock. Mark quickly gave a knowing frown to Natasha, as Freeman arrived armed with stacks of used pale green computer printout paper, a pen, and a short, grubby, bitten pencil. That ought to keep you going, although I don't know if you'll get very far without an interpreter, he sighed. It's a funny old language to understand. Suddenly, Natasha burst out into a trio of long sentences in Russian. Dr. Freeman threw his arms outward, palms up, raising his eyes to heaven. Mark and Jane smiled with relief at Natasha's quick linguistic turnaround. Well, if you don't mind, I'll leave you young people to converse as best you can. He chuckled into a chesty cough. A guy in my position <laughs> should know better than to smoke. The door was again unlocked to allow Dr. Freeman out of the room and relocked behind him. He waved back at them through the glass door. Phew, that's a relief, commented Mark. If he'd decided to stay, we, we would have had to rethink a way to communicate with you somehow. Jane leant forwards to speak to Natasha. We have no connections, whatever, with any secret service, British, Russian, or American. We're just a doctor and a nurse caught up in this amazing affair. Nathan was double-crossed, as you were. You both represented an expendable means by which to carry out an evil plan. It was an inexcusable act of treachery on both of your parts, and on the part of the secret services, both here and in Britain. Was it the money and the promise of a secret life abroad that tempted you both? Jane felt anger well up inside of her as she said the last sentence, thinking how anyone could do such a terrible thing for money. It was not for money, you must believe that. They threatened to accuse members of my family with crimes they did not commit and to make sure that they were sent to labor camps. They said they could arrange this through influential people within the KGB. What else could I do? I made myself vulnerable unwittingly by becoming an English-speaking personnel of an embassy abroad. Nathan and I tragically fell in love, but during the short time we were together, he never once spoke of how he became involved but I did believe him when he told me it wasn't money. I think he was blackmailed also, something in his past, maybe. 
I don't know. We planned to be together when the job was over and done with. We wanted children. Natasha broke down in tears at this point, attracting the attention of one of the guards outside the room. They all froze as he unlocked the door and came over to them. What's the matter with the girl? he demanded, looking at them from one to another. Mark's quick brain went into action. Well, you just imagine how she feels not being able to speak to us because of the language barrier, he said briskly. All we want to know is why she thinks she was shot at, he added, putting his head in his hands in pretense of frustration. Natasha composed herself and began firing some sort of questions or accusations in Russian. The guard made for the door, muttering something about everybody ought to speak English. He again locked them in. We haven't much time, Natasha. You must tell us how to find the bomb, said Mark, all the time expecting Freeman to come back. I know this is the right thing to do to tell you, but I can only explain the route up to a point. Mark sighed out loud with frustration. Why only up to a point? Because I only went part of the way. I took Nathan to meet up with some members of a distant group formed in Moscow, according to my orders. I'd met Nathan, as arranged, three days before. I was acting as one of the many tour guides at the Kremlin for foreign officials. We managed to spend time together without raising suspicion. We also spent a night together. I'm sorry, Jane had objected. I know how you must feel. There were two men and an older woman, Natasha continued, wiping away a tear. They knew of a secret way into the basement of the Kremlin itself, through some sort of tunnel system which carries pipes and cables. I really know little more than that, she said, apologetically. I knew it! Mark quietly exploded. The machine really, really works! What machine do you speak of? asked Natasha quizzically. Oh, it's just a device I had built to help with that project. Mark turned to Jane and smiled. He certainly didn't want to put Natasha through all the pain of finding out that Nathan Fraser had been alive in a coma while he had played around with his brain impulses. Natasha, how could we contact these three people? If they knew of you and Nathan had been double-crossed, and that it was planned to kill you both when you'd done your bit. Don't you think they might cooperate with us and remove the bomb? And if they knew you were still alive, reasoned Jane. I think they might, as they are friends of some of my relatives who are also in the dissident movement, but it may be difficult to contact them. They wouldn't know who to trust. They would easily think that they were being tricked somehow by the KGB. Ah, uh, but not if you could speak to one or all of them. If they could somehow be convinced it really was you, and if it could be done through a communication system which was entirely separate from the international telephone network, Mark added. Mark was trying hard to think. Ironically, the telephone in the room jangled into life, pushing Mark's turn of thought to one side. Jane answered it. It was Freeman wanting to know if they'd made any progress with the girl. Had they been able to use any information they may have got from her in their statistics? Jane told him they hadn't, that they were going to have one more try. He wished them luck and said that he was glad it wasn't him. He put the phone down. Jane did the same and said it was okay. They still had some time to talk. Everyone breathed again. Mark continued. Is it possible to find out about the existence of any secret communication systems? Surely there must be one with all of the sophisticated devices around today. Oh, uh, of course, I remember now, recalled Natasha in a wave of enthusiasm. There is a number I was told to use if I was ever in trouble. It is some special relay number. I must try and find it. She reached over to her bedside cabinet and took out a tatty hold-all. After a good deal of rummaging, she fished out a slip of paper 
which was tucked down inside the split plastic lining. This is it, she announced. I am to telephone this number, a Swedish number, and then give them a coded sequence of letters and numbers to check off with their copy. Then they would give me their code to check off against the one I have here. If all is well, and they believe it to be me, then they contact me with a Moscow number, which will be able to safely relay my message. She put the piece of paper down. I was told that if I received no reply, then I was to cut the call immediately. She glanced at the paper once again. I was instructed to only use this number once, and only then in the event of a real emergency. Natasha looked up and smiled for the first time since they had met her. Will you do that for us all? asked Mark solemnly. Yes, of course. But the message, what do I tell them? She looked at Mark for a reply. You must work out a brief, simple, unambiguous wording to ask for the bomb to be completely disabled and removed and somehow secretly disposed of, and then to arrange a return call to say it has been done. We must know this, Mark added. Only then can we begin to relax. As the message to be in Russian or English? Jane asked Natasha. It has to be in Russian. But if the message is intercepted, it wouldn't matter which language it was in, because it would be recorded and interpreted later. Okay, Natasha, we'd soon better make a move out of here, if you don't mind, before someone gets suspicious. Will you be able to make the call safely? inquired Mark. Leave it with me, and we'll do it as soon as possible. How will I make contact with you again? Mark gave her Edward's home phone number, as it was his suggestion as part of the plan, should it be necessary. He would inform Edward as soon as they could. On the way out, they passed Dr. Freeman's office window. Mark shook his head, and Freeman threw his arms out again, palms up to heaven. After some quick goodbyes, they left right away, risking it, being thought suspicious. They had not inquired if there were any more gunshot victims to interview. Now all they had to do was wait.